Well, greetings out there in YouTube land. Uh, after a nice restful vacation, uh, we're back in video production and opening some boxes from uh, very generous uh, viewers. Uh, this one came from Jim Robinson in Illinois. Beautifully packed by FedEx. And lo and behold, it looks to me like a really snazzy Kalamazoo Damn, I can't wait to get it out of the box. Let me set down the camera, get this out, and up on the workbench so we can get a good look. Well, yes, indeed, it is a mighty Kalamazoo. We know that this was sort of a sub-brand of Gibson back in the 40s and um, early 50s. Got a nice metal here uh, grill to protect the speaker. Missing handle top looks like it's been nibbled on by some of our rodent pals. Jim warned me this jewel was a trifle moldy, but that can all be taken care of, okay? Just so that it's basically sound and complete, and this one does appear to be. Let's turn it around and see what the rear looks like, and also of the amp. And here we go. Uh, you can see the volume uh, knob has been changed cord has been cut probably for the good of mankind um, no tubes but that's not a huge issue uh, we've got looks like a transformer here and a transformer over here unless one is a filter choke and one is an output transformer I'm at a loss uh, as to why there's two it looks like a massive Alnico what about a 10 inch speaker uh, which I don't believe is correct. I think this uh, age of amp, it probably should have had an electrodynamic speaker, but that's fine. This is an early speaker and it'll probably sound great. Okay, so let's pull this back panel and take a look at uh, what more we can see. Well, it looks like we struck gold here. Uh, looks like a brown recluse spider nest and an old cigarette butt. Okay, all which add to the ambiance here of the an old vintage amp. Okay, I'm no closer to understanding why there's two uh, transformers in there, but uh, let me, just for fun, I know it's premature, let me put a little bit of uh, like a grease cutter here and uh, a detergent and trying to clean this surface and see if it'll clean up. Well, I guess there's a little bit of difference. Okay, it's not exactly a gleaming uh, pristine finish uh, but uh, we'll see a little more strenuous cleaning here and it might look even worse what a shame the cigarette butts not my brand but the uh, spider nest is so I'll smoke it instead and for all you white speck fanciers there's a few on top but check out the assortment down here on the surface sweet this chassis is unusual in that it's just an L shape of metal and there's wood sides so it's these two screws here that should be removed and then the chassis will slide out hopefully leaving the transformers in place and will I have no way of knowing where those wires go I have to be sure I don't yank on them because you know how unpleasant it is to have your wires yanked well, I got the chassis out and flipped it over, and after fighting off a horde of brown recluses, uh, it looks like it's been worked on right there. Um, but speaking of waxy capacitors, good grief. 1940 called. They want their capacitors back. All right, kind of scary looking uh, spider webs, and God only knows what else. <clears throat> you can see that both... So those transformers are connected in here to the circuit so uh, I'm going to have to do some analysis to see exactly which one's which. I have a feeling that's an output transformer and that's probably a filter choke. We'll see. Look at the finish here on the uh, power transformer. It's been hidden here on the chassis forever and protected from the depredations of rats and other creatures. Okay, let's do a little quick detective work here, especially for you budding amp repair folks. Uh, we're going to figure out what this is. Well, there's two wires coming out of a transformer right off the bat. 
that ought to tell you filter choke. Let's see if they're in series in the power supply. This wire comes down here and it's from the rectifier and that's going to be the B plus output and the other side of it is going to go to the plate of the probably 6V6 over here so there's no doubt that is a filter choke. This is never a good sign. Uh, one of the speaker wires was loose and you can see where it's pulled right out of the uh, secondary of the output transformer. If I can't find where it went and reconnect it, uh, I guess I'll have to replace that little jewel lurking back there in the darkness. Well, I got the output transformer uh, out of the cabinet. You can see where the wires have literally been yanked and the transformer wire was pulled right through the paper up to that point. This one, when it got yanked, pulled up so far and then broke. So I'll have to excavate under this layer right here to see if I can find the other end of that little stub of wire that just fell on the floor. Well, I excavated deep down into this uh, winding here of the output transformer, and you can just see the tip of where the wire broke off right there, and there's just nothing I can solder to. Okay, and if I excavate deeper, then I'll be disrupting the winding and, and creating shorts. So it looks to me like uh, this poor old jewel is going to have to be replaced after all these years. I'm assuming that all the original uh, cloth insulated wires were replaced at some time with these scrawny red wires with green uh, garden tape insulation. Probably because the original wires were eaten by rodents. Uh, and somebody went in to try to fix this, so they just spliced in replacement wire where they thought it belonged. I got the filter choke out, and you can see where the nibbling ceased. It was right about at this point right here. And then these uh, supplemental scrawny red uh, wires were put in uh, series to complete the circuit. I wonder if it actually worked when they got through doing that. Well, that's about it for day one on this amp. We've examined it externally, removed the chassis, and we see that we've got uh, several waxy old caps to replace. Uh, we've got to clean this up, just blow it out, get all the spider webs and other God knows what out of it. Okay, replace the electrolytic caps. I guess they lost weight over years, over the years. Their belt's kind of loose. Also, I love this internal fuse. Can you imagine you're playing like a major concert uh, at Wembley Stadium? I mean, the crowned heads of Europe are all in the audience, and your Kalamazoo craps out on you. So you've got to, you know, say, hey, just a minute, hang on, gang, and uh, pull the chassis, install a new fuse, put it all back together, and then get back to work. I guess that's why they move fuses from back here to up here, eh? Okay, I'm uh, going to have to, probably going to have to replace the output transformer, which is pretty puny, and uh, rewire the filter choke with some proper gauge wire. Well, I think you have to admit, I got my work cut out for me, okay? This thing has probably not played in quite a few years, and um, let's make it our goal in life to get this thing back as clean as possible, and working just as well as it did when new, if not. Well, I went in last night and did some research on this jewel, and with the help of the vintage uh, guitar price guide, I figured out it was a 1948 to 52 Kalamazoo KEA or Kia amp. And lo and behold, with that information, I was able to find and download a schematic on the internet. Thanks to uh, Hannes Gerber and the Radio Museum. Now, there are things about this circuit that are quite unusual. Um, when I see a four-tube amp like this, I assume it's single-ended, that I have a 6V6 here being driven by two separate preamp tubes, perhaps two stages of amplification, or perhaps one preamp for each of the input jacks. But such is not the case. We have a single uh, 6 SJ7 pentode preamp and two 6V6s. Now there's no uh, 
phase inversion transformer or phase inversion tube here. So the assumption might be that these are wired in parallel as some early Gibson amps were. But such is not the case. Let's take a look at the circuit and see uh, how Gibson accomplished what they did. Let's start at the beginning, uh, which always makes sense. Two uh, non-self-grounding input jacks, each with 47K grid blocker resistors. Okay, so far so good. We only have 220K of impedance to ground here, which is a little low for modern uh, guitar pickups. Probably going to increase that to around 500K. Come into the grid of the 6SJ7, and I've drawn a diagram here so that I could uh, read the uh, pins properly. Uh, you see that it uh, has a 1000 ohm bias resistor and is cathode bypassed with a 20 microfarad cap. All right, the um, output then comes from the plate through a 0.05 microfarad uh, coupling cap and down here to the 0.5 meg volume control. So far so good. And as we hopefully recall from previous videos, when you apply the signal to the grid of a tube, the plate current from cathode to plate through the tube will create a amplified and out of phase signal on the plate. So drive the grid, you get an inverted signal from the plate. So we're presenting a, a high amplitude but inverted signal to this end of the center tapped output trend. But let's look at the other side of the coin and that is that the two cathodes here are connected together. So whatever's going on in this cathode is also going on down here in this cathode. Now the other rule about uh, driving grids and getting inverted signals is when you drive the cathode, the signal on the plate is not inverted. So the cathode here is driven. The grid to avoid it uh, from interfering with this process, we're going to ground it and the cathode then is going to create an a amplified in phase signal on this plate. So we have out of phase signal, in phase signal, out of phase signal, in phase signal, and we have our push-pull effect on our center tapped output transformer. This creates a very very high current low voltage uh, output signal then to drive our speaker. So in effect we have phase inversion uh, occurring without a phase inverter tube or transformer. Very clever. Here we drive the grid, here we drive the cathode, and we get our push-pull output. Now second revelation is we look here at this filter choke. Now there's no doubt this probably came in the amp from the factory. It's nestled back in here. There's a place for it. There's two holes on the floor to screw it in. It looks original. But you'll see there is really no filter choke here in the power supply of this schematic. They show a 1000 ohm field coil for the electrodynamic speaker. But uh, I'm wondering if this is a, another version of the amp that may have used a permanent magnet speaker with the filter choke in here between the two 10 microfarad um, filter caps. Then when we look here in the circuit at the original electrolytic filter cap, we see that it is a 1010, okay, which fits in very well here with the filtration that we see in this schematic. So for today, let's replace all of the waxy capacitors. Uh, probably coupling caps uh, going from the first stage of amplification here, our 6SJ7, to the volume control and then uh, to our 6V6. Uh, let's also uh, change the electrolytic filter caps and let's check the resistance here 
in what appears to be a 220 ohm uh, bias resistor for our 6V6s. Okay, and then once we get this jewel up and operating, uh, we'll of course uh, check for our uh, tube bias uh, plate dissipation. I know I gave up yesterday on trying to repair the output transformer, but today I thought why not try to solder a piece of fresh wire onto that little stub of what I think was the broken uh, secondary winding. It, this, they, both of these of course go to the speaker and remember one of the speaker wires had been ripped loose from the output transformer. Now to see if that little stub really was the broken end of the secondary winding, uh, let's hook up our ohmmeter between this, what we know is a secondary uh, lug, and the other end here that I've soldered to. And if we get like one or two ohms of DC resistance, then I believe that the secondary winding then uh, has been fixed and that between this wire and this wire it will drive a speaker. So let's hook up our ohmmeter and see what we get. Okay, I've got my ohmmeter uh, probes connected from uh, this wire and the newly soldered wire and yes indeed there is continuity. It's around 8 tenths of an ohm which should be about right for the secondary winding. Okay, now I have to double check to see if there's a short anywhere between the secondary winding and any of the three wires of the primary winding. So let's move this probe over here and touch it to each of the ends of the primary wires to see if a short exists. Okay, one end of the ohmmeter is connected here to the uh, secondary winding and now we'll go down the line of the three primary wires this is what we want to see. We want no continuity, which would indicate a short. Okay, that one's clear. That one's clear. I think we have a repaired output transformer. Uh, I'm sure going to give it a try and see. The next step will be to stabilize this freshly soldered wire with epoxy. I'm going to coat both of the uh, secondary wires with epoxy to uh, keep them from wiggling and breaking loose again. Okay, then we'll let that five minute epoxy set up and then I believe this output transformer will be ready to be tested. I mixed up some five minute epoxy and made a, a dam here with electrical tape and just poured it in there so it'll really stabilize both of these uh, secondary leads and so they can't be torn off again, at least not easily. Alright, while that epoxy is hardening, let's uh, focus our attention on replacing these four capacitors. Here's a helpful little hint. Clean all around your input jacks so that the washer and nut can thoroughly ground the jack against the chassis. Okay, when you get a buildup of corrosion and paint, uh, your jacks may not be grounded. You'll get all kinds of uh, hum and, and other extraneous noise. So I've cleaned it away to bare metal here, and now the jacks will be very well grounded. All right, those waxy uh, capacitors have been replaced. Two 0.05s and a 0.1 microfarad at 600 volts and then down here is the bypass cap 25 at 50 volts that has been replaced. I've also checked the status of all the other solder uh, connections and the values of the resistors. Next I'll clean the pot uh, and the volume control afterwards little joke there and then we'll move over to this side. While I was at it I scraped and cleaned a lot of the surface rust off of the control panel and um, cleaned it up where the paint showed more clearly and then sprayed it with clear lacquer and I really think that it looks a whole lot better. Certainly not a lot easier to read. Well here it is with the masking tape off and I replaced what I think is a Stratocaster volume control knob with a more appropriate chicken head knob. Now let's focus our attention on replacing the electrolytic filter caps. It's two tens at 450. 
All right, the two 10 microfarad filter caps have been replaced. Uh, I removed that uh, steel retaining loop that held the old uh, filter cap and I have installed a new three wire power cord that grounds the chassis and runs through both the on off switch and the fuse with the hot wire. Okay now I think what I'd like to do is to first clean up this top and spray it with uh, clear lacquer and then mount the output transformer and the filter choke back here on top of the chassis simply because it I see no benefit to having them screwed down here on the sides with uh, wires looped and hanging around loose and then having to remove them anytime the chassis has to be removed to me everything should be in one piece so I'm gonna do that well I uh, cleaned up the top of the chassis removed a lot of the surface rust then sprayed a light coat of clear lacquer uh, over it to sort of preserve it and keep it from rusting again. Um, I touched up the black here on the uh, bottom of the power transformer and also installed the output transformer and the filter choke on the chassis itself. Um, and uh, now the unit is autonomous and doesn't require that the output transformer and filter choke be mounted separately in the cabinet with exposed wires and all. Uh, this just seems like a whole lot uh, better solution to me. Well, time has come to open a couple gifts from my good friend Craig Hollabaugh in uh, Colorado. Uh, one large heavy box and one small lighter box. And as you can see, Casey is definitely in the mood uh, to help me open these up and see what's inside. What do you think, Casey? Let's open this one first, okay? I've already uh, cut the tape and let's take a look inside. Luca just showed up to help us because it appears there's some cat treats here on top. Our old favorite sniffer, uh, Jackie. Good Lord, I don't think I've ever seen boxes receive a better welcome than this from the kitties. Uh, let's open this one up then and see what all's inside. Looks like a Frisky's party mix for you characters. Okay, we'll open that up in just a second. Well, let's see here. We've got some metal uh, bodied tubes, a bunch of nice looking capacitors, and some nitrile gloves. There's still more to come. How about a neat Victor test adapter kit? Okay, this looks like it plugs into uh, different tube sockets and allows you then to uh, make connections to them. Well there's so much I had to start putting it up here on the couch. We've got uh, several different potentiometers, diodes, cable tie downs, q-tips, some snazzy little brushes for cleaning tube sockets, and resistors. Good grief. Um, some catnip filled mice, jumpers, uh, looks like tube sockets and shields, capacitors, capacitors, 6SN7 tube, bunch of resistors, uh, terminal strips, good heavens. Just an incredible assortment of very useful uh, parts and components. Well, it looks like Jack and Casey like their little catnip mice. Casey's taking it easy over here. She's being cool about it. Play with that catnip mouse, Jack. But I have a feeling that what's in this uh, heavy white box is going to really be uh, the major surprise here. So let's get it open and see what's inside. Meanwhile, Jack is celebrating the arrival of those cat treats and catnip mice. So while Casey and Jack are trying some of the Frisky's party mix, I've opened the white box and we see that there is some solid object in here that I'm going to need to get out and unwrap. Well, Jack, take a look at this. 
this incredible device that Craig uh, hand built for us. Look at that on top. It's embossed with a deluxe reverb schematic. All the sides have schematic decorations. It's a voltage and current uh, monitoring device where you plug in say the amp that you're testing and you can monitor exactly how much current and voltage it's drawing. Uh, also uh, because I watched a video that Craig made of uh, him uh, constructing this device and believe me this was not just something he threw together out of some old scrap lumber. He did a, a beautiful job of it and he has posted a video showing how he built this and I'm gonna put a link in the video description to help you find it and I really encourage you to watch it because he uses all sorts of complex devices and machinery to build this thing and he just absolutely first-class components also there is an isolation transformer built into it it's absolutely beautifully designed and constructed look at these seams that he has here on the woodwork incredible I fancy myself to be a pretty good woodworker but nothing like this Craig's uh, work takes the cake so thank you for the huge assortment of components and gifts and treats uh, for Casey, Jack and me and most of all uh, Craig thank you for this fantastic device that you so generously uh, hand built for us we really appreciate it here we can see a close-up of the voltage and current meters the AC receptacles and the all-important signature at the bottom so nicely done, Craig. You're quite a craftsman. Well, some bad news. Uh, the output transformer that I thought I had saved uh, by rewiring the secondary ended up failing when subjected to uh, voltage and current. The primary winding, uh, one of them, one of the half windings, uh, failed almost immediately. So I'm afraid that it's just not going to be usable. Uh, I do, however, have what I think will be a really nice replacement. Much stouter, more robust. It's from a, from a BYOC, which is Build Your Own Clone, a Tweed Royal build, which is a deluxe, okay, 5E3 deluxe. Um, so this should be ideal since it was made to connect to two 6v6s and push-pull and uh, have a, a proper output for an 8 ohm speaker which is what uh, is in the cabinet so I'm going to redrill uh, mounting holes and install this on the chassis I should also give credit to a viewer named John Fegan who sent this uh, transformer to me as well as a bunch of other nice uh, components thanks John the filter choke has been wired in series in the B plus circuit and over here we have the output transformer uh, being wired as uh, push-pull output transformers are uh, with the brown wire to one plate blue wire to the other and in this case the red wire goes to the screens of both of the 6v6s well, here's a quick review of the parts that were removed, the defective output transformer, the three waxy caps, the electrolytic filter caps 1010, that uh, radial um, cathode uh, bypass cap, and some other small gauge wire tape and other garbage. Now let's take a quick scan here over the circuit uh, after repairs and uh, component replacement. Uh, we can see the installation of the output transformer, all the new capacitors, the cleaned volume control pot, um, electrolytic filters have been replaced, and uh, a new power cord. So let's flip this over, put in some tubes, plug it into the current limiter, hook it up to that speaker, and see if we can get any sound out of this beast. Alright, the output transformer secondary is connected to the speaker 
I've already checked and the voice coil is in good shape on this speaker. Uh, I've inserted tubes. I've got a pair of uh, modern wafer base 6v6s. It's just what I had handy. Uh, a really nice NOS 6SJ7 uh, and a new uh, 5Y3. Okay, I've also uh, connected the Euro tubes uh, bias uh, meters in series with one of the 6v6s just to kind of keep an eye on things so we don't cause any harm. Also, I am plugged into the current limiter. So uh, let's flip the switch and see what happens. Well, the first try was a total dud, so I checked the most obvious possible culprit and it's a burned out fuse. Burned out probably back around 1951 or so. Um, so I put in a fresh 2 amp fuse. Now let's flip the switch and see what happens. Oh, it looks like good things are happening. Let's see what happens when it stabilizes. Well, it looks like 38 milliamps plate current and 277 plate voltage. Uh, that's going to be probably about right. Uh, I don't have my calculator handy, but I'm thinking, what is this, around 10 watts of plate dissipation? Let me multiply it out and see. Sure enough, 10.44 watts, which is perfect in this old amp. Uh, now let's check the right-hand 6V6. Okay, here we are set up on the right-hand 6V6. Let's flip the switch on and see what we get. Well, it looks like around 40.2 milliamps at 274 volts. So let's multiply that out and see what our plate dissipation is. And it multiplies out to 11 watts, which again is ideal uh, for an older amp like this. So uh, I really think our uh, bias is set just fine. Now I've got the audio signal generator set to 500 cycles per second, uh, running into uh, one of the two instrument inputs. Let's turn it on and see what kind of volume we get. Okay, it's warmed up. Nice clean tone. Seems like good volume too. Well, it looks like the refurbishment is a complete success. Well, I checked through my part stash and came up with a handle that's actually pretty darn close to what the original was. I think the original was white to go along with the piping, uh, and this one isn't, but it goes along, I think, nicely with the color and age of the amp. Now, it's no fun installing it, okay? You have to straighten out one of these giant uh, staple ends here, and then pry this piece out of the top of the amp. Then we're going to have to separate the base plate from the loop so that this end of the handle can uh, go into that space between the two. So the plate now is removed. We're going to insert the sliding bracket here into the horseshoe, put the plate back on, put the whole unit down here into the top of the cabinet and then splay those staple legs out so that uh, it can't pull back out when we pick up the amp. Bear in mind now with this much larger output transformer uh, this amp weighs more than ever so we have to be sure that these legs are stout. Okay that retainer is back in place. The uh, end of the handle slides easily through that space. Now we'll flip the cabinet over and splay out those uh, staple legs. While I was hammering away on those uh, staple legs, I noticed the wonderful cushion feet on the bottom of this amp. You know how happy your wife would be if you uh, set this down on her Louis the 16th parquet table and dragged it around a little bit. So let's put some decent rubber feet on it while we have it upside down. Okay, there's four original style feet held on with uh, number eight nuts and bolts. So uh, let's finish attaching the handle up here on top and uh, then we'll be ready to put the chassis into the cabinet. Well, here's the handle all installed in the original brackets. I've pulled up 
with considerably more force than gravity pulls down on the cabinet and uh, nothing budges so I think this is going to work and provide a safe way to carry the cabinet around plus I think it, it looks acceptable on this old cabinet it certainly doesn't draw any adverse attention well here's the chassis reinstalled in the cabinet I haven't put on that lower rear panel yet just wanted you to see how nice it went in uh, I'm using these smaller diameter 6v6s so there's clearance between them and the Alnico magnet housing. You can see how the leads uh, for the secondary from the output transformer reach up here to the speaker terminals quite nicely. Okay, so let's uh, uh, install the rear panel here and then turn it around and begin an audio test. Here's one final look at the amplifier all assembled, chassis in place, and rear panel installed. Well, the initial audio test was rather disappointing. There was sort of a buzzing, flubbing sound to the speaker, which really isn't a huge surprise on a speaker this old. And now that I look at it closely, this is the gasket for mounting the speaker, it is a front mount speaker, not a rear mount speaker like this. In other words, it would go in from the front of the cabinet and this gasket would fit up against the cabinet, which means that it has no gasket here and also it is a mess. Okay, now uh, I'm going to have to clean it up a little bit and then we'll check it by feeling uh, the cone excursion with the fingers. Okay, hang on. Well, here's the speaker cone cleaned up, and it's real soft, um, which would contribute uh, to the flubbing for sure. But uh, the main thing is you're never going to see a guitar uh, speaker with a dust cover this large and uh, covered with very soft material to absorb high frequencies. If anything, this may be a bass speaker. I really don't think it's an appropriate speaker for this circuit or this amp. Um, both the suspension is too soft and this just isn't right at all here. So uh, let me go check uh, in the storeroom uh, at my stash of speakers and see if we can't come up with, with something a whole lot better for this amp. Oh, and one other thing before I go. Remember this had that metal screen? Well, I'm wondering how much this metal rim up against the metal screen and not uniformly uh, might not have been contributing to the rattle that I heard. Okay, there's no doubt you have to have a gasket of some sort here to separate the uh, metal basket from a metal screen like this. Okay, so uh, let me go see what I've got uh, in the uh, old speaker stockpile. Well, look what I found on the speaker shelf. A Fender musical instrument, special design, 10-inch speaker made by CTS, probably around the 49th week of 1969. It's a nice old speaker with a sort of rustic looking basket. And check this out. It's been a very nicely professionally reconed, good stiff suspension, and a doped surround so with the gasket that we need looks to me like this is a complete winner okay so now it's time to install this jewel and see uh, what uh, this thing sounds like with a decent speaker all right here's that Fender uh, musical instrument special design speaker installed firmly against that metal screen with lock washers under the nuts always be careful not to over tighten the nuts because you may end up distorting the basket and making the voice coil rub on the pole piece and you know how bad that is okay so uh, let's see now if the chassis will fit in and uh, see how it sounds After checking the values of those old carbon comp resistors in this circuit, uh, they were so far out of whack that I had to replace every single resistor. Let me give you uh, an example of just how bad they were. 
For example, how about the 1 meg resistor which fed the B plus to the screen of the 6SJ7? Uh, we see on the schematic it's supposed to be a million ohms and it's brown, black, green. That's 1 meg. But no, how about 16.9 meg? Okay, which is effectively going to shut down the screen of the 6SJ7 and greatly reduce its ability to amplify. Uh, that's the case then with all of the carbon comp resistors and that's why they've all been replaced with brand new resistors of the proper value. Naturally, since nothing's ever as easy as it should be, uh, the output transformer now collides with the uh, fender speaker basket, uh, so I'm going to have to change the angle, I'll bring this forward a little bit uh, so that it will clear. Well, the output transformer was moved forward a little bit. Now there's plenty of room between it and the speaker. The chassis has been reinstalled. Speaker is all wired up. It is an 8 ohm speaker, thank heavens. Uh, so let's put that uh, lower panel on, turn it around, and see how it sounds now. Well, we got the mighty Kalamazoo all back together and singing like a canary on crack. Uh, we got Ollie and Jack who are like two canaries on catnip, okay, and they're ready to play a few tunes for you. So let's see how this jewel sounds. <laughs> surprise um, in response to some viewer requests for better fidelity on the audio demos I bought a Shure SM57 microphone and I'm going to include uh, some audio demos using it uh, today so that you can compare it to the camera microphone let me know in the comment section what you think if it's worth the uh, time and effort to uh, use the microphone for the audio dem demos or if the camera uh, microphone is good enough. Okay, I await your decision. My method will be to mic the center of the speaker of the amplifier being demonstrated and then to make a digital recording of uh, the microphone output on a Tascam digital recorder then I will download this to my computer and merge it with the video file showing the demo process. 
Like I said, in the comments, let me know what you think of the improved process. And uh, if you have any uh, helpful suggestions, I'd appreciate hearing them. Uh, so let's get started. does it for this heroic restoration of the Kalamazoo 1948 to 52 KEA amplifier. We got off easy on this one. All it took was a new speaker, a new output transformer, a complete new tube set, all new capacitors, and all new resistors. Other than that, there was hardly anything to do. We hope you enjoyed the restoration and audio demos. Uh, I want to uh, give special thanks to the gentleman who contributed this amp uh, to our channel uh, so that this feature could be made. Also to the uh, many viewers who sent in parts and uh, other things, especially Craig Hollibaugh uh, with his uh, beautifully constructed um, ammeter and uh, voltmeter uh, monitoring device. I also want to uh, say thanks to all my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors uh, for keeping us on the air and advertising free. If you'd like to join them, there will be a uh, 
link in the video description to help you to do so. Also, don't forget the link I'm putting there to show how Craig built that beautiful volt and ammeter monitoring device. Now for our second feature, uh, I've had a problem with the 32 Ford truck in that uh, driving around on hot days when you stop uh, the carburetors percolate, leak gasoline down in the engine, flood it and make it very difficult to restart. So I came up with a way to solve that problem. I think you'll get a kick out of it and it really does work. If that sounds interesting, stay tuned. Well today's job on the hot rod is going to be a very difficult one but hopefully very rewarding. Part of the problem of using a uh, really ancient carburation like this is uh, they really don't work as well as modern carbs. And a problem with these is really not due to their design, but what happens when I uh, am out driving around, and it's over 100 degrees here most of the time, I come in and I park it, and the heat of the engine then builds because there's no more water circulating from the radiator. And as the heat builds, it heats up the gasoline in the fuel bowls and it actually boils, spills over and goes down into the engine and floods it. Now where this becomes a real issue is say I drive somewhere, stop, uh, come back in about 20 minutes and the car is hard to start. Not only that, raw gas in your cylinders will thin out the oil and cause premature wear okay, of your rings primarily. So I've got to come up with a way to insulate the fuel in the bowls. Now remember only the center two carburetors are actually functional but I have to come up with a way to insulate them from the heat that develops down here in this aluminum uh, intake manifold. Now what I'm thinking of is to make a quarter inch thick masonite spacer that goes between the carburetor and the manifold. Now that will insulate it from the heat that develops in the manifold and have the spacer protrude out say this far, sort of like a diving board to pre uh, prevent the heat rising from the manifold uh, from uh, heating up the gas uh, in the fuel bowl and boiling it. Sort of like a burner on the oven and the water, in this case gasohol, which unfortunately boils at a much lower temperature than regular gasoline. But that's all we can buy here, okay? The politicians have inflicted the alcohol, the uh, ethanol on us uh, and we're stuck with it and it causes all kinds of grief and this is a good so what I've got to do is undo the linkage uh, and the fuel lines and then undo the nine bolts that hold the three carburetors in place lift them off fabricate a spacer that will fit here between the carburetor and the manifold that will allow the gas and air mixture to pass through and then put it all back together and pray that it works Step one, I have removed uh, those air horns that go on top. You can see because the middle one's the only one that works, that's the screen that is darkened. Next, I'm going to disconnect the linkage from the accelerator at this point and the linkage that connects this array of carburetors here from the passenger side array. And then I can undo the nine bolts and hopefully these will lift off. Well, step one, removing the uh, accelerator linkage was easy, but then uh, in the world of unforeseen consequences, I uh, pull off the gas line and it's shooting gas uh, like, you know, three feet and I couldn't figure it out. So I start pouring it into a gas can uh, that, and finally after about a gallon and a half, I'm starting to wonder how, since this is higher than the gas tank, can this be happening? And then it occurred to me the gas tank is sealed and hot uh, and therefore it's built up a bunch of pressure so I uh, pop the uh, the gas tank uh, cap let out the pressure and now the incessant flow of gasoline has ceased thank God just in time for the arrival of the fire department now after making a mental note to buy a, a vented gas cap that actually is vented um, I removed the connection between this bank of carburetors and the linkage for the passenger side. Now it's just a matter of nine bolts and lift. Of course, it, nothing ever works that easy. These things have probably been heliarc to the manifold and will require uh, cold chisels and sledgehammers to remove, but we'll see. Well, I found a use for some of that gas that poured out uh, when I undid the line. 
Uh, I have an old tree stump over here I've been tripping over for a couple years. Uh, so let's give it a dose of its own medicine. I want you to imagine just how much fun it is to undo the nuts here on the inside of these carburetors. Not much room for a wrench, eh? And you can't fit a socket on there either. No fun. Well, eight of the nuts have been removed and now it's number nine which is proving to be a nightmare. Have you ever noticed how there's always one? One nut or one bolt that just fights you to the death. And it's generally the last one and I wonder if it's because we we sort of subconsciously know which one's going to be terrible so we put it at you know last and sure enough it's a self-fulfilling prophecy so I may have to make a, a wrench a 90 degree bent wrench to get this we'll see well I got it using the old vertical wrench with screwdriver uh, technique okay and it's loose now I've got to finish well, all nine nuts have been removed, and uh, against all expectation, all three carburetors are loose and ready to lift off. I won't have to use thermite and a seven-foot breaker bar to try to get these things loose. Um, it's strange, isn't it, how the things that you predict are going to cause you grief never do. And then things like a pressure built up in the fuel tank and impossible to reach nuts which, you know, wouldn't be a bad name for a band, um, will surprise you and just, you know, make a fairly easy task a living nightmare. But I guess that's life in the hot rod biz. Okay, time to pull these babies and uh, get working on uh, making that spacer. One more thing, whenever you're working with carburetors, uh, make sure that every single nut and washer is accounted for before you lift them because sure as heck if you don't one of them is going to fall into the intake manifold and into the engine okay so take inventory before you lift okay put that uh, get a tattoo that says that well the carburetors are off and as you can see uh, these are the plates that were uh, used to seal off the manifold uh, for the four carburetors that uh, were not going to be used. I might change that in the future. And here we have the uh, the gasket which I'm going to use as a uh, pattern for my uh, masonite spacer. Alright, let's see if I can get this uh, off. Oh yeah, well that was hard, wasn't it? God, that was terrible. Um, and now I can use this as a pattern. Well, just like when you do speaker reconing, you uh, use tape to protect uh, areas that you do not want dirt and grunge getting into. So I used a little um, duct tape here. Also notice how nicely these stainless steel uh, Blanco plates uh, polished up. They still had that uh, film that, that uh, comes on sheets of stainless steel to protect it. So I just peel it off and did some minor cleaning and now these babies are ready for the car show. I also intend to clean up the intake manifold around here, hopefully. Uh, the dripping and leaking and stinking and everything else will uh, not uh, reoccur and restain it. Okay, so uh, this will all be cleaned up real nicely before everything goes back together. This is kind of interesting. I'm looking at the bottom of the carburetors here. Uh, first off, this thing looks like brand new. It's just beautiful. Uh, I thought they probably had to remove the butterflies from the outer carburetor so that they wouldn't uh, hit those block off plates and interfere with the movement of the linkage but they're recessed in so deep that they were able to leave them in place so these are absolutely complete and um, operational carburetors which is great okay once again a nice discovery I've used the old gasket here to draw my diagram for my heat shield um, and now it's just a matter of drilling out the holes for the Venturis and um, I'm going instead of having two separate holes for fear that this little isthmus here might uh, come loose and fall into the engine I'm going to round it off like a bathtub okay okay here's that heat shield uh, out of tempered masonite with all the holes drilled and uh, in place and with the extension here that will block the heat rising from the manifold to uh, overheat the gasoline in the fuel ball. I painted the heat shield with that VHT header paint that can withstand like 2000 degrees and uh, so that it won't stand out against the aluminum, won't look like masonite 
and then uh, it's time to install the carburetor gasket and now the carbs can go back in place. Well everything went back together pretty well. I dropped the carburetors down on the two blocking plates and on that heat uh, insulator. You can see that little diving board sticking out there. And then uh, hooked up the gas and I had to do some adjustments in the linkage because now this carburetor is about uh, a little over a quarter of an inch taller than the other two. It's really not that noticeable but uh, there you can see the insulating plate in place. Okay and the linkage works smoothly so uh, now it's time to do the other side. Well I went for a test drive with just the driver's side carburetor with that insulating plate in place. The passenger side doesn't have one and I thought it'd be interesting to uh, see a comparison after the ride uh, to come back and let the heat soak take place and I'll tell you I'm really pleased with the result. The carburetor that has that insulating plate the fuel bowl is actually probably about ambient temperature. It's probably around 98 degrees whereas the fuel bowl oh, on the other side is hot enough that it's unpleasant to touch it. Okay, probably 130 or 40 degrees, if not more. So the insulating plate really does work. Uh, so now that I've proven that, uh, I'll go through the work to install one over here on the passenger side. Also, while I had these little air scoops out, I thought it'd be kind of neat to paint them black inside to contrast with the chrome on the outside. Otherwise they're just sort of as cast and the uh, contrast between the inside and out is not that great. Ugh, look at that though. Sweet, huh?